we started this worship service by singing this song, an old hymn, about a sacrificial lamb who was sitting on a throne. And there's this sort of interesting request, and you all sang it, that God would somehow wake our souls up. And we ask that because we don't naturally see it. We don't naturally see or appreciate all that God's done for us. And I think we don't see it because we are too often tired, we become numb, we get distracted to what God is doing. So we sang, awake my soul and sing of him who died for me. We all sang this together. And I, I hope that God did just that. And right now, we're going to talk for a couple moments about how the life and death of that lamb earns us freedom and rest. And then we're going to end this morning's service gloriously by celebrating how we can be united with Christ through the Lord's Supper. So right now, though, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm preaching a sermon. Here I am. And let me tell you what preachers do. About half of preaching is studying Scripture, and uh, I love Scripture. God's Word is robust, and it's fascinating, and I study, and I read a lot, and I listen, and I read lots of other scholars on Scripture, and I ask hard questions. And really, half of the preacher's job is that whatever he's, he or she says, that it is as much or as little as the Lord says to us. That's about half the job. The other job of a preacher is to read an audience. And I'll be honest, I do a better job communicating God's word if I know you better. Like when I know the sorts of struggles our church is going through, the kinds of struggles you may be asking, the sorts of struggles you experience in life. Like seriously, I write better sermons when I talk to more of you. So open invite, let's hang out this summer. Uh, grab coffee or I, I love ice cream. We can hang out with my kids, this could be fun. But no, joking aside, I, I have missed interaction over the last couple of years, and we've got some time to make up for. But here's my read. When I've talked to people over this last season, here's what I've learned about what's going on in our church community. There are some people, there's a small segment of us, some people in our church family are going through really, really difficult times. And some of it's probably related to isolation or stress, but it just seems like more people than normal are going through valleys right now. Sickness, stress, isolation, family, mess. Like, our elders have a ton to pray for and a lot of shepherding to do right now. So some of you, a, I'd say a small-ish percentage of a pie graph of our church family, you just need rest and time to heal from just extraordinary difficulty and challenges. That's some of you. But there's more of you than that. Everyone else, just, here's my read on our church family. If you're doing okay, that's great. Lots of us are doing okay. But if you're doing okay, you're probably okay but exhausted, like a little more than usual. These last years have been a lot. Most people I talk to are tired. They're a little bit more on edge than normal. Some of us are a little bit more impatient than normal. It's easier to get annoyed with people, it seems. Sometimes it's easier to get sad or overwhelmed. Uh, of course, we're all a little bit worse at socializing these days, but you'd expect that. But it does, and look, it does feel like COVID was over like a long time ago, but realistically, if you remember the mask mandate in schools ended March 2nd, like this year, not, not that long ago. And since then, the news, global, national events haven't relaxed anybody, I don't think. So here's my read of people. As I look at scripture, as I look at people, we're all a little bit burnt out and tired, which means that what we need is to take time to rest, recover, rejuvenate, just sort of collectively get to a healthier, less stressful, less busy mindset so that God can use us more powerfully in the future. This is easier said than done, of course. Like, rest is hard. I think lots of us realize, hey, I need rest, and we're still restless. Like, none of us are really good at this. You go, you go home to relax, and you sit down, and you turn on the news, which, we're so dumb. Like, that, this doesn't work, right? 
Um, or we'll, we'll go home and we'll binge Netflix and it uh, doesn't help us sleep. Or we'll, we'll sit and scroll on our phones and look at all the bad news and all the stuff we're missing out on and look at how much better everyone else has it sometimes. Or you know, some of us really work hard and we go on vacation and we fill up our schedule with travel and activities. And then anyone else come home exhausted <laughs> because even our vacations are overscheduled. That's most of us, right? Or maybe you just walk around in your backyard and you get stressed out by all the work you have to do, right? Anyone else have weeds growing? Uh, we need to figure out a big, underemphasized part of the Christian life. This is a big deal in the Bible. It's rest and resting, being refreshed. When you read the Bible, feeling cared for, being re-energized is a massive theme among the gifts that God gives to humans. Now, if you're most, like most of us and you need rest, you're going to want to lean in and hear what God says about it. This could change your life. What struck me is that the very opening paragraphs of Scripture reminds us of how important resting is. I won't, I won't read it, but you can look it up. The story goes, God worked for six days, making the heavens and the earth and the world, and God rested And the Bible is really careful to point out that God didn't rest because he was tired. You know why God rested? God rested on the seventh day because we (laughs) get tired. And somehow, even at the opening uh, chapters of creation, God wants us to know that we work and rest is important. Later, Jesus, of course, just goes out and says it, that the Sabbath wasn't made for God somehow. It was made for people to underline the point that we all need rest or take a verse like Psalm 46.10, God says, be still. Some translations have that phrase, stop your striving, rest, and know that I am God. Be still. And, And I get it, like being still is really, really hard. A lot of us just by default we were programmed somehow to keep going, keep scrolling, keep thinking, keep planning, keep being productive. It is so hard for so many of us to do what God commands, to be still in silence before the Lord. But realizing like who we are and who God is in a, in a healthy, balanced sort of way. We're not good at this. Or take Matthew 11. Uh, Jesus just invites us. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Like somehow Christianity, being close to Jesus, coming to the Lord, it, it's, it's designed to change people who are weary and burdened. And, and coming to Jesus should, should change people with a lot on our plate, a lot on our minds, and that's most of us, Right? Jesus claims, and he's right, that he gives people rest. This becomes a massive topic. And next week, we're going to talk about some specific biblical practices for resting and being rejuvenated. Today, we're going to talk about one sort of very small, specific part about how coming to Jesus brings us rest. Today, we're going to talk about the fact that one of the things that makes us restless, one of the things that burdens us, One of the things that gives us a lot of stress comes from unnecessary guilt. And I want to be clear, resting isn't about not working hard. The language of the Ten Commandments is uh, six days shall you labor and on the seventh rest. So the Bible isn't anti-work. This isn't about uh, not keeping God's law. Be holy as I am holy. God commands in a bunch of places. Uh, But the fact is, a lot of us are exhausted, We are restless because we have allowed ourselves to become slaves to productivity, to guilt, and perception. One of the reasons we get so stressed out is we worry about what other people think about us. We worry about if we're doing enough, which means that a lot of us, instead of being able to rest in who we are because of the sacrifice of of Christ, instead of being secure and confident and who we are as sons and daughters of the Lord, we, we, we get restless and insecure and competitive. And we exhaust ourselves just trying to 
somehow work hard enough to gain God's love and approval, we forget, I think, how to rest in who God says we are in Christ. And some of us can't find rest because our entire identity, like who we are, gets wrapped up in what we do. And this gets exhausting. Because for, if, if you are what you do, then when you rest, you become something different. You, you can tell this via what calls a crisis. This is what I've seen. I've seen men who have their identity so tied up in their work that when they don't have work, they just sort of crash. It becomes not just a financial crisis, but an identity crisis. Like, as a man, who am I if I'm not a productive worker? That messes people up. Or I've seen moms, and I, I realize this can be in reverse, but this is what I've seen. Kids move out, uh, go to college, and it's a, it's a crisis. Who am I if I'm not a good mom? This is really hard for people with health issues. Like I, know, I know kids whose whole identities are in sports. When the doctor says, you, you got one more concussion, you got to quit this team, it's trauma because I'm a whatever player. Now I'm not. It's hard on our elderly people who you visit them in, in the nursing home and they go, I used to help everybody and now I can't even like feed myself. Like this, this link between what you do and who you are is such a traumatic thing that even worrying about this causes a lot of stress. I was reading a pastor who said that the world's fundamental problem is that we don't really understand who we are. We're children of God made in his image. But instead of that, we define ourselves by any number of things that we do instead of the one that we belong to. And that's why we don't rest. And part of the gospel is saying that you are more than what you do or don't do. You are defined by what Christ has done for you. If you really believe that, you're able to rest. You're able to be still. You're able to release burdens, and we'll talk more about that next week. Or you know, if you hear last week, Pastor Lyman said, and he talked about the weight of shame, that we've done things or haven't done things, or we've had things done to us that weigh us down. And that, that's a problem. In fact, if you think about it, even keeping God's commands can be a burden. When we keep God's law in order to be good people instead of because we're God's people. Now, last week, if you're here, we, we prayed a prayer of confession and asked questions like, God, am I really loving my neighbor as much as I should? That's a hard one, right? Because answering that question can both prod you to be better and it could also weigh you down a bit. Am I ever doing enough to reach God's holiness? No, Right? God's standard of holiness is so high that the work of attempting to achieve God's standard can be exhausting. But Jesus says, come unto me and work really hard. Now, it's not always this. He says, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. How can that be? Do you, do you know why Jesus can give you rest? Here's what the Bible teaches you are not the sum of what you accomplish. You are what Jesus has done for you. You're not what you do. You're what Jesus has done, which means that what you accomplish doesn't define who you are. Rather, who you are in Christ should affect what you do. And I'm convinced that if you could start to see this, if you could see who you belong to, I think it gives you not just comfort and rest, but seeing who you belong to actually gives you a stronger motive to pursue holiness, to love God and to love your neighbors, than the weight of guilt. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a theological construct. It's often called imputation, and it's a little complicated, uh, but the basic theological drift from a lot of scripture is that if you're a Christian, or if you think about Paul's language, if you're in Christ, here's what happens. God the Father, the perfect judge, looks at you in judgment, looks at your performance records, sees how you fell short of his standard, but because of the cross, 
God sees Jesus. And instead of evaluating your good or bad works, instead of evaluating what you've done and how hard you tried, in that moment, God the Father sees the accomplishments of God the Son who perform perfectly. And God gives us who don't deserve it all the benefits that Jesus earned on the cross, which is why my grace is so amazing. Now you could read the confession. I print it in your bulletin for some more precise language. Let me just give you some scripture. This is Isaiah 53. I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he, so Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment bought us peace. You can add rest to that if you'd like. It was on him. And by his wounds, we were healed. We all We're like sheep, we've gone astray, each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a prophecy pointing to the cross about Jesus, talking about the fact that Jesus satisfies the justice of God for the sins of the people of God. All we like sheep, you know, we've done, we've gone astray. We've earned by our actions isolation and separation from God. We've wandered away. We've earned punishment instead of reward. But see what God does? He lays on Jesus the punishment that we deserve. And we somehow gain the reward that he earns. And, and Jesus becomes a substitute. He's bruised for our iniquities. He suffers. He dies, so we don't. And this brings us back to the Lord and saves God's people. Like, this is the gospel. This is what we celebrate. This is this idea that Jesus took all of the pressure that we have on our own performance. He took all the guilt and the shame that we still may feel. And Jesus, he just took it. He took our pain and our suffering and the punishment we deserve for the sins we have done. And, and Jesus gives us better than a clean slate. We'll take 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, so that's a righteous for the unrighteous, to bring, look what it says, to bring you to God. In other words, Jesus suffered. Jesus died. And we'll celebrate that at the table in the Lord's Supper. The righteous, that's Jesus. For the unrighteous, that's us. Uh, he's perfect, we are not. And see what he accomplished? To bring you to God. Like all the work that you go through, all the stress that you go through, am I good enough for God to love me? All the anxiety that we get, we're working harder, hoping to live into our purpose, just hoping that you know, God might love us more, thinking that somehow we'll get closer to God because of our performance or our beliefs. Like, Jesus already did that. He already accomplished what we sometimes subconsciously work restlessly at. I'm convinced if you really believe this, part of being in Christ means that you could rest because God loves you. Not because of what you do, but because of Jesus. Not based on a performance evaluation of you, but based on a performance evaluation of Christ. That's imputation. Jesus paid it all. So come to Jesus, you with a guilt complex, you who are faking it until you make it. Come to Jesus you who can't say no without feeling bad. Come to Jesus, you who are heavily burdened because you're working and working and stressed and never feel like you've done enough to please the Lord. Come to Jesus. 
you who worry that if people really knew what you were thinking right now, what was going on, they would condemn you. Come to Jesus and find rest. You could find rest because Jesus did the heavy lifting of redemption. This is a big deal. This is why the Apostle Paul could say things like, this is 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is why Philippians 3, I'll start in verse 8. It says, I just have to read the whole paragraph. This is amazing. What is more, Paul writes, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from keeping the law, but having a righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says he resolved to know nothing apart from Jesus and him crucified. It's a heavy emphasis. Uh, If you think about it, most modern Christians, we, we talk about a lot of other things. We, you know, modern Christians, we've got a brand, we've got tribal markers. Christians have opinions about everything. And sometimes we forget about the most important thing. We've gotten good at giving burdens to people and exhausting people. We Christians have so, in fact, this week I I discovered, I didn't know this, you, you can buy a Christian guide on barbecuing. I didn't know that. Like, I, I, I read it, and I realized I, I had to repent, because all this time, I've been grilling like an like a atheist, I guess. And, um, man, uh, I, I guess I need to work on that. But Paul writes, because the problem is we, we get so hung up on so many other things, and we forget the cross. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then. Take a stand, folks. This is what you got to fight for. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. There's this idea, and I realize that talking about freedom on 4th of July weekend is a little bit loaded, I guess. Uh, But if you look at the context, there is, the context tells a story that there are religious teachers that teach that God does accept you if you perform well enough that if your past behavior looks bad or if your performance now isn't something that they approved of, if you're outside the box, God doesn't love you. That's not the gospel. That is a heavy burden. In fact, verse 6, if you have it open, says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And look, I think a lot of Christians think that a lot of other things count. We need to stand firm, it says, I think because by default, well-meaning people of faith become slaves. You can become a slave to your own performance. You can become a slave to your guilt or shame. You can lock yourself in a closet of shame in fear that if other people know what you're thinking, they'd judge you. If God knew, which is so silly to worry about because he knows everything, he might not love me. That's, that's slavery. And Paul says it is a cross that gives freedom, and you need to stand firm and avoid taking more burdens than you have. Jesus took the burden. We can stand firm. Don't allow yourself to get weighed down by self-imposed burdens. Instead, rest in Christ. You know, I'm just, I'm convinced that not only are too many of us restless, sometimes it's because we feel guilty. Sometimes maybe subconsciously we're trying to 
make God love us more or earn our own salvation. But Paul says not only are we not, or not only are we restless, but Paul seems to think that we're, we're in danger of becoming slaves. Slaves because we think that if we stop doing, we stop being. Here's what a Christian counselor wrote. He says, if you find your identity in the achievement of your duties, you find many troubles. And here's what he says. First, you will always search for something to excel at in order to outperform others and demonstrate your superiority. And once you believe you've found that thing, you can get overly committed to it and possibly even obsessed with mastering it and other things. Other people, your health, your relationships will no longer matter. Instead, they'll be placed on the altar, look at this line, the altar of success to the God of achievements. And soon you get so competitive that winning is all that matters. And the more you win, the less compassion you have for other people. In time, this will turn to disdain and pride over those who are hurting, struggling, and as you succeed, you become prideful and unpleasant to be around with your boasting of your accomplishments, even if it's only subtle, by moving attention to yourself and your achievements. And when you inevitably fail or lose sometimes, it crushes you. You become distressed, distressed, panicked, and devastated, which makes you both miserable and miserable to be around. I think that, in a way, describes too many of us when our identities become what we do, and we need to learn how to rest in Christ. And I think it starts with knowing that you are more than what you accomplish. You are what Christ accomplished on the cross. And of course, there is more to the Christian faith and the doctrine of imputation, but the truth is when you really start to appreciate all that Jesus did for you, I think the other things come along. You learn that gratitude becomes a stronger motivation for loving your neighbors and pursuing holiness than guilt and shame are. Right now, I'm just convinced in this season that we, we really need to learn how to rest. We need to rest from the rat race of performance. We need to learn how to find our life in what Christ has done for us. In fact, in a moment, we're going to sing our closing hymn. And uh, Jesus, I am resting, resting. It's, a, it's an older hymn. I'm not positive everybody knows it, but you should sing it anyway. I want to encourage you to think about the words. Um, but the words communicate, basically, that if you could only see how much Christ loves you, if it would really sink in all that he's done for us, what he's accomplished on the cross, if that could sink in into your soul, you would find rest. And you would, like the lyrics paint this so well, you'd be satisfied, rejuvenated, made alive. That's what happens when you see what Christ did. And I think we need this now more than ever. Communion brings freedom and rest. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, it was. You can't possibly add to the holiness, righteousness, or love that Christ earned for us. You can't possibly improve on the love that God has for you as his child, which means you could stop striving and rest and know that he is God. So Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to rest, help us to stop our striving. Father, we naturally work hard at earning what we cannot. We get stressed out and burdened by guilt that you have paid for. And Father, I pray that you would give us the knowledge of the joy of what you are, and can you help us to rest as a result? I ask all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.